Years ago, I was speaking at Especially for Youth, and I ran into a couple of girls that I had just taught the semester before in seminary. I say I ran into them when in reality, they ran into me, literally. They tackled me, and they said, Brother Halverson, Brother Halverson, we are the coolest people at EFY, and it's your fault. And I thought, well, I, I know you're cool, but what do I have to do with this? And they said, you remember the day you taught us how to mark scripture? We were together with our EFY group sharing scripture. And our counselor said, will all of you open up to Alma chapter 17? That was the chapter we studied together in that marking day of seminary. We opened up our scriptures and all of a sudden there were oohs and ahs from the entire group as they stared at our books thinking, no way. How did you find that much truth on those pages? And it was marking the scriptures that those students had learned in seminary the semester before. You see, what I would do each semester is take one day and tell the students, I'm not going to teach you anything today. I'm just going to study my scriptures, but I'm going to do it out loud and on the board. I had projected onto the whiteboard blank pages of scripture, so it would look just like their scriptures looked. And then with a set of different colored markers, I started studying and marking my scriptures on the board with the whole class following along in their scriptures. I felt like a symphony orchestra conductor. I would mark something and then turn and everyone would be marking. And I would circle and they'd circle. And I'd draw a line or write something in the margin and they were all doing the same thing. By the end of that one day, they had a couple pages of scripture that were just dripping with markings. And it was amazing to see how excited they were about those pages of scripture. There was evidence in front of them I have paid a price and learned something here. And whether it makes you the coolest kid at EFY, marking the scriptures will help you record and remember the things that God has taught you as you've studied. I'll admit, there is no perfect marking system, but however you choose to mark, it's worth doing. I've had some students over the years get a new set of scriptures and are kind of possessive of their pristine, clean copy. We mark the scriptures to make them our own. Think about what Nephi said in his first chapter, that I am writing upon plates which I have made with mine own hands. There's something powerful about that. When you have scriptures that you have made with your own hands, that the markings and insights are the ones that God has given to you personally and that you've treasured them to the point of recording them on the page. You know the scriptures have become yours when they're irreplaceable. I've been studying out of this set of scriptures for decades, and there's not another set quite like it. In the days before smartphone scriptures, there'd be times I wanted to study my scriptures and didn't have my set, and my wife would have hers and say, well, you can just read from mine. I go, ah, honey, thanks, but your version just isn't as true as mine. And she'd roll her eyes, and I admit, and mine aren't as true for you as yours are. You see, she and I have both made our own scriptures our own scriptures. To have a set of scriptures that is uniquely yours, kind of like an old baseball glove, well broken in so that it catches flies almost on its own. To have a set of scriptures that almost flips open to verses that have come to mean something to you. They almost teach themselves. In fact, to me, that's the main reason why we mark. We mark so that we can learn better and we mark so that we can teach better. Now, if we're gonna mark our scriptures, I guess that means we need some tools to mark them with. Over the years, I've typically had my scripture case everywhere I have my scriptures. And in it, I keep some of the tools that I use for scripture marking. My go-to tool has always been my multicolored pencil. That began for me when I was a deacon. And my quorum advisor gave me a set of scripture marking crayons, oh, eight or 10 different colors. But I went through and I assigned a subject to each of those colors. My subjects have changed over time, but I've been color coding scripture ever since. And now it's second nature to me. Red is miscellaneous and black is evil or sin. Orange are things I need to do to be like God and pink are promises he makes to me if I do it. Now my topics don't have to be your topics and my colors don't have to be your colors. Like I said, they've changed over time. I sense have added purple as a temple color. When I started, I didn't realize how many scriptures would be about the temple. I didn't have the eyes to see. But now, when I'm teaching scripture especially, it's so nice to be able to thumb through. And if I'm giving a talk on missionary work, I just look for yellow scriptures and there's material to work with. If I wake up in the morning and think, what do I need to do today? What should I be working on? Well, find something in orange and there's something I should be doing to become more like my Father in heaven. 
preparing talks, lessons, you name it, scripture marking has helped me teach more effectively. Now beyond my colored pencil, sometimes I just need a pen to write notes in the margin. For this, I want something really fine tip so I can write in between the lines or up the side. Sometimes I'll even pull out of my scripture case some post-it notes so I can write notes on those and stick them right onto my page of scripture. If I'm studying topically instead of sequentially, a post-it note won't quite do. And so I typically have a little notebook that I keep with me. And I've gone through dozens of these over my lifetime. As I just take notes on certain subjects that I'm pondering, or when an insight comes that's a little too long to write in the margin. The key is just to record the things that the Lord is trying to teach you. Now, for many of us, we don't use our paper scriptures as much as we used to. So perhaps we don't need the same kind of scripture marking tools that we once used. In fact, I've put away my scripture case much more frequently than I used to. I now do a lot of my scripture study, like many of you, I'm sure, on my phone. But I'm so grateful that the digital scriptures allow me to mark as well. In fact, the digital scriptures have more of an infinite supply of margin space where we can record the insights that Heavenly Father has given us. And that's really what scripture marking is all about. Recording and remembering the things that God has taught us. Let me say it again as clearly as I can. There's no perfect marking system. And there doesn't need to be. So don't wait until you've got it all figured out or think that you have to perfect your color coding. In fact, my wife, who knows and loves the scriptures as much as I do, always laughs whenever I talk about scripture marking. And she rolls her eyes at my color code because all she ever uses is one red pen. And that's all she needs because she's doing with that one red pen what I'm doing with all of my colors and codings and everything else. She's recording the things that God is teaching her. In fact, rather than thinking of the right way to mark, maybe it's better to identify the wrong way to mark. If you've ever marked something and then come back later and wondered, why did I mark that? What did I get out of that verse? What did I see there? Then that's evidence that we didn't mark it very well. In fact, worst of all, it reminds us that we learned something. We just can't remember what it was. The point of marking is to remember the things that we've learned, to draw our attention back to them as we learn and relearn, as we teach and reteach. There are so many different ways that we can mark our scriptures. The most common is simply to underline or highlight, which are the two main things that you can do on your digital set. That's often best when you find a key word or phrase in a particular verse, something that jumps out. Well, let it jump out more visibly the next time you see it by marking it. And especially if you tag it or code it in the digital or write something in the margin on your paper set, then you'll remember why you marked it to begin with. One of those key nouns or verbs in the grammar of God. Sometimes it's a matter of circling one word and drawing a line to connect it to a related word in another verse. I remember doing that with 1 Nephi 5, where I'd see something that Sariah had said and then how Lehi responds in a loving way. And I wanted to visually see those connections more clearly. So I started drawing lines across the page. In some ways, isn't that what a cross-reference is? It's just connecting dots from one verse of scripture to another. And so if it's not on the same page, I'll write my own little cross-reference in the margin. This verse takes me there. And once I get there, I'll usually write the other verse there so it can find my way back home. If you want those scriptures to keep moving you forward in a single direction, that's where scripture chains come in handy. And the way that works is you find a verse and then write in the margin where you should go from there to the next verse. And then there you write the reference to the next verse and on and on. I remember doing that on a bus trip to Nauvoo. We knew we'd be going to Carthage. And I started to wonder how much Joseph would have known that Carthage was in his future. And so I started in section 135, the story of the martyrdom itself, and wrote a reference there to the earliest scripture that seems to foreshadow the martyrdom of Joseph Smith. From then to the next and the next and the next, it was this long road to Carthage. And this scripture chain helps me follow it. Sometimes instead of just underlining or circling or drawing lines and cross-references, sometimes numbering things in scriptures can be really helpful. Kind of an enumerated list. If you're studying Mosiah 18 and you see the elements of the baptismal covenant, for example, number them to see these are the things that God is asking me to do. And here are the things that he's promising me in return. 
A fun word to add to your vocabulary is marginalia. And that's just saying all the stuff we put in the margins. That can be your own cross-references, your own statements of principle. That's a great thing to add to your scriptures. Once you've concentrated the truth and packaged it, well, you can write that package in the margin or at the top of the page. This is one of my morals of the story, one of my takeaway lessons here. You can write quotes along the bottom. I've even seen other editions of scripture published with lots of extra margin space. So you can basically scripture journal. That's a powerful way of scripture marking as well. Something that I found really helpful and something that distinguishes between how I highlight versus how I underline is a lot of times you'll see repetition in a given chapter or book. And I found that if I shade it in in my hard copy or highlight it in my digital, I can scroll through and those highlights really jump off the page. For example, in The Last Supper, do you realize the two words that come up most frequently are love and world? Jesus is trying to teach his apostles to love one another and to overcome the world. And you know what's amazing? In the letters of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, guess what John talks about more than any other thing? Love and the world. He learned the lesson well at the Last Supper, and then he taught it once he got the chance. And by highlighting that, it literally jumps off my page, and I start to see the focus of certain discourses. Sometimes you'll see a given chapter, and there's a theme in the chapter. For example, 2 Nephi 5, Nephi says, We lived after the manner of happiness. To me, that becomes the thesis statement of the chapter, and so I shade that in. But then I'll put a little code at the top and say, okay, everything I shade in this color are examples of how we live after the manner of happiness. And throughout that chapter, you find all these amazing details about, oh, they prepared themselves for defense. That's part of living after the manner of happiness. They built a temple. That's part of living after the manner of happiness. And again, on my page, as I've learned it, and as I prepare later to teach it, it's all right there waiting for me. Study section 25 of the Doctrine and Covenants, where Emma Smith is described as an elect lady. Well, what makes her elect? Well, if I highlight the phrase elect lady, and that becomes almost my, my central organizing phrase, then I can start marking everything else I see in that section that made her such an elect lady, and what would make you and I elect as well. One last skill I'll mention is to add to the topical guide. The topical guide is an incredible resource. It's so helpful in topical scripture study, preparing talks and lessons and so on. But sometimes the best scriptures on that subject aren't on the list because they're not obvious enough. There will be times in your own scripture study, I promise, where the Holy Ghost will help you see a principle that never would have made it into the topical guide. My fatherhood set of scriptures was like that for me. Well, I want to be able to remember those verses. And I already have a well-organized place to put them in my topical guide. So in my own set, if I find a scripture on a certain subject that I just love, it's come to mean something to me because the Spirit helped me see it, I'll go to the topical guide and see if it's there. And usually it isn't, so I'll write it in the margin. I'm adding to my own topical guide. And now when I have to give a talk or a lesson on a certain subject, I still go to the topical guide. But the first verses I look up to remember are the ones I added there. It's like having a home base that you can keep adding additional insights to. I remember once in a bishopric I was in being part of a disciplinary council. And the person that had come in for this council was not very penitent at all. I felt worse about the sin, and I wasn't the one who committed it. I realized that this person, if they were ever to repent, needed to feel godly sorrow. Now, I know there's a scripture about godly sorrow, and the topical guide can remind me where it is, 2 Corinthians 7. But once I got there, throughout my own scripture study, I had found so many beautiful examples of people or of groups of people that had truly illustrated godly sorrow. I needed a home base for that. And so I had put all those cross-references right next to the verse on godly sorrow in 2 Corinthians 7. Because Paul mentions the phrase, but there's no illustration of what it looks like. I had to add those myself as I marked those scriptures. And as I sat in that council with this wonderful member that needed to understand the gravity of their sins, 
I turned to my scriptures, found one of those other illustrations, and shared it. It made such a difference in that setting as this person was able to see, if I remember correctly, from the book of Ezra in the Old Testament, what godly sorrow really looks like in someone else's life. They began feeling that godly sorrow themselves. At the end of the day, the most important thing you can remember about marking scripture is just recording your thoughts. That's it. Just write things down. Whether it's an underline or a circle or a highlight or a cross-reference matters less than the simple fact I'm showing God I value what he's teaching me. Keep a notebook. Write in the margins. Send yourself an email reminding yourself of the things that you're learning. Those are things that you and your posterity can treasure. King Benjamin told his sons that one of the great blessings of Scripture is that it helps us keep truth always before our eyes. And by marking our scriptures, we don't just keep the truth before our eyes. We keep our truth there. Elder Scott said that even holding a pencil or a pen is an exercise of agency, one that shows Heavenly Father how much we want to learn from Him. And that exercise of agency is richly rewarded. When Jesus came to the Nephites, one of the interesting things that happened He asked Nephi, the prophet, can I see your scriptures? Can you imagine what that would be like to hand your scriptures over to the Son of God? And Jesus thumbed through them or turned the plates or however he did it. And he said to Nephi, wait, didn't Samuel the Lamanite prophesy of the resurrection? And Nephi said, well, yes, he did. And it happened. And the Lord said, why isn't it in your scriptures? And Nephi realized, we never wrote that down. And he fixed that immediately. I sometimes wonder what it would feel like if I passed my scriptures over to Jesus and he opened them. Would there be any evidence that I had learned from him, that I had treasured his word? I hope that he would see by the things that I've marked, underlined, highlighted, written, that I treasure every bit of truth that he's given me. However you study the scriptures, whether it's digital or in print, large margins or small, I invite you to get into the habit of writing down the things that you learn. You'll be amazed at how much more comes that way. And best of all, these scriptures will really become your scriptures. Scriptures that you have made with your own hands.